Hi everyone, welcome to the High Energy Seminar. Uh, today our first speaker is Dr. Uh, Mogosha Sobolevista, and she is currently an astrophysicist at CFA uh, working on operating design support. And she got her PhD in 2006 from Nicholas Copernicus Astronomical Center in Warsaw, and she's from Holland. And uh, today she's going to talk us about the astrogalactics. Uh, good afternoon. So today I wanted to present our ongoing project in which we use telescopes like Chandra and XMM to study uh, radio galaxies with uh, sub-kiloparsec scale extragalactic jets. And this project is done in, in collaboration with Aneta Siemiginowska, Julia Migliori, Matteo Guainazzi, Martin Hardcastle, Luisa Ostorero and uh, Łukasz Stawasz. So the outline of my talk is as follows. First, I will introduce uh, radio observations of compact extragalactic jets. And then I will try to convince you that it is uh, very important to understand the physics of those jets, because by understanding them, we can understand uh, a very important aspect of AGN and galaxy feedback process at the very early stage. Then I will present uh, our results, and the results are twofold. So I will talk first about X-ray environment of compact radio jets, and then I will concentrate on one of the sources in our sample, and I will present a broadband radio to gamma ray modeling of its spectral energy distribution. And I will finish by pointing out what are our, go our goals for the future. So I would like to start with uh, talking about uh, a class of radio sources that you may be familiar with, and those are so-called uh, gigahertz peaked spectrum sources, or GPS. So those sources have um, radio, radio spectral turnover frequency at around one gigahertz, and uh, the linear size of the radio structures is below one kiloparsec. So this basically means that all the radio structures are completely contained within the host galaxy. Now, if we concentrate on uh, GPS sources that have symmetric radio structures, so structures that are two-sided and dominated by uh, radio lobes or hotspots, then we end up with a subclass called compact symmetric objects, or CSOs, and uh, compact symmetric objects will be the topic of this talk. So here in the figure, uh, I'm showing an example of a source called Park 1718, and the two-sided structure is clearly visible. And radio observations allowed, allowed to determine that the separation between the two lobes is about two parsecs. Now, this source uh, has multi-epoch uh, radio monitorings, and so it uh, was possible to determine that the lobes are um, separating from each other. And, uh, by combining the radio linear size and advanced velocity of the radio features, it was possible to determine that the radio structures left the core about 100 years ago. And this is uh, possible because of the symmetricity of those sources. So here now on the left, I'm showing uh, just two examples of the radio data, radio measurements. And on the y-axis, we have a hotspot separation as a function of time, Those da these data were taken over a decade or two decades. And the slope of those lines fitted to the data is representative of the uh, advanced velocity of the hotspots. Uh, the determined age for those structures in those two sources is about 1,000 1, years. The plots come from the work by Polatidis and Conway in 2003, and this is a sample literature that uh, contains information about the GPS sources and CSO sources in particular. <clears throat> so why is it important to study compact symmetric objects? First of all, kinematic methods that I just described uh, suggest that uh, jets in those sources may be very young. So in general, the measurements suggest that they are younger than about 3,000 years. So those sources offer a unique opportunity to study a very interesting aspect of the AGN and galaxy feedback process. 
because we can probe galactic conditions at the time of the radio jet launch and initial jet expansion. And at the same time, we can study the impact of the young expanding jet on the innermost regions of the galaxy. Compact symmetric objects are also considered to be among the progenitors of the large scale radio galaxies. And because of this, it is of a fundamental importance to understand the genesis of this uh, FR1 versus FR2 type dichotomy seen in the large scale radio galaxies and uh, answer the question whether these evolutionary differences are due to the central engine of the AGN or due to the environment and also a question about when some of, uh, why some of those jets they never expand beyond the host galaxy. Now also uh, high energies X-ray and gamma ray um, observations are particularly well suited to help answer these questions because those uh, photons contain information about the properties of the young jet, about the surrounding uh, ISM, about the interactions between the jet and ISM, and about the physics and production side of the high energy emission itself. Uh, however, one has to be aware of some observational caveats. So in the radio band, those jets are resolved down to milli arc second scales. And of course, X-ray and gamma ray observations, they don't resolve those structures uh, to the same spatial resolution. And so in our studies, we rely on spectral inference. So perfectly, we would like to uh, study and model broadband spectral energy distributions. But it turns out that CSOs are relatively faint in X-rays, and to date we have only one source that has been detected in the gamma ray band. So that's why Chandra and XMM are quite important here uh, because of the faintness of those sources in the X-ray band. So a few years ago, we, our group initiated a Chandra program to study compact symmetric objects in X-rays, and this slide summarizes uh, the current status of our project. Uh, we currently have about 25 uh, compact symmetric objects uh, with redshifts below 1 that have been observed in X-rays either with Chandra or with XMM Newton. And kinematic ages of those sources have been measured for about 70% of the sample. We have 100% uh, percent, uh, CSO X-ray detection rate, even with short exposures with Chandra, and 2 to 10 kV X-ray fluxes are on the order of 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 13 x per centimeter square per second. Mean photon index is of about 1.6 plus minus 0 0.4. Then in the next step, we followed some of those sources, nine sources with uh, deeper X-ray observations to um, determine better their X-ray properties. And in this talk, I will concentrate on our two most recent discoveries. I will talk about uh, X-ray obscuration in the compact symmetric sources. And uh, this is important because for the first time we may start answering a question on whether those sources are compact because they are young or whether they are compact because maybe they are confined by the dense environments in which they expand. And the second topic will be the uh, spectral energy modeling of uh, the only gamma ray emitter uh, in our sample. So here in this figure, I am showing a diagram that has uh, size of the radio source in parsecs on the y-axis. So the scale goes from one parsec to one kiloparsec. And the radio luminosity at five gigahertz on the x-axis. The radio data come from two publications by Ann and Ban 2012 and Tremblay et al 2016. Uh, the solid line here shows a correlation that was reported in that second paper, Tremblay et al. And this is based on the radio data obtained, obtained uh, as part of the VLBA imaging and polarimetry survey. But you can immediately see that there are uh, around 10 sources that lie below this correlation. So those sources were classified uh, primarily in this first paper as uh, compact symmetric objects. Uh, the labeled sources here in this figure uh, they refer to sources for which a substantial uh, X-ray intrinsic column density was claimed, uh, at least in one publication. And by that I mean an age that exceeds 10 to the 23 uh, per centimeter square. But several of those measurements were done based on short Chandra or XMM uh, 
uh, exposures with poor uh, signal to noise ratio. And in those two cases marked in black, uh, those claims were based on Berposak's observations. So we decided to uh, focus on several of the sources in this sample. So the three sources that lie along the correlation and the Compton thick candidate that we <coughs> identified in our Chandra study and follow them with uh, uh, XMM Newton. So let me now uh, uh, show you uh, some data and the data will be of the source marked here and this one. So we were able to determine that none of those three sources lying along the correlation is Compton thick. And instead, we confirm the Compton signature of this source here. So these are our X-ray Chandra and XMM uh, images of the source. Uh, the images are centered on our target. And both Chandra and XMM data, they clearly show a spoiler X-ray source that is uh, located around 25 arc seconds from our target. Mm, this was impossible. Those two sources were not impossible to be resolved in Beppo Sachs data. And uh, the figure here on the right hand side shows the data for our target and for the secondary source in red. And it is clear that the iron uh, line emission that was used as an argument for the Compton signature of the source actually comes from the, uh, from the spoiler uh, source. So this source is not Compton thick. Instead, uh, in the Compton Tech CSO candidate that we identified in our short Chandra observation, uh, with XMM we clearly detect a, um, a neutral uh, iron line with significant equivalent width and a reflection dominated X ray spectrum. And we derive for the source a intrinsic uh, X ray absorbing column density at the level of 8 times 10 to the 23 per centimeter square. So this source. Uh, has significant X-ray absorption, intrinsic one. So now I'm showing again the same plot with size of the radio source and uh, radio luminosity on the axis, but now the uh, symbols are color coded with respect to the intrinsic absorbing column. And uh, the dashed line here is not a fit, it's just a line that connects objects with intrinsic column density in excess of 10 to the 23 per centimeter square. So this figure can be, this result can be interpreted in two ways. So one interpretation is that uh, for the same radio luminosity, the X-ray obscured sources appear to have smaller radio si uh, sizes than X-ray unobscured sources. And one of the explanations may be that uh, they are confined by the environment and they cannot expand freely. Alternatively, you may look at this the other way, that for a given radio size, the X-ray absorbed sources appear to be uh, more luminous in radio. So X-ray luminosity is driven primarily by the environmental density or by the jet power. And again, jet power can be linked to the density of the environment, for example, through a mass accretion rate. So this is the first uh, evidence coming from the uh, X-ray band that the very early stages of the expansion of the extragalactic radio jets may be affected by the environmental density. Okay, so by now you probably noticed that there are several outliers here that appear uh, unabsorbed or only mildly absorbed. So the source here in the lower, uh, lower right corner, this is uh, the only source in our sample with relatively high redshift. It has a redshift of 1.6. And the source up here next to the one level to 0108, uh, this is a relatively weak, weak X-ray source and we only had 10 counts in our five kilosecond observation. So we fixed the photon index while deriving its uh, uh, intrinsic column density. Now, the source right here. This is uh, PARC 1718, and this is the only gamma ray emitter in our sample. And I will now switch to describing its spectral energy distribution. So, uh, on the right hand side, I'm showing a seven years uh, Fermi LAT count map uh, from our paper led by Julia Migliori. 
Uh, the yellow cross is a uh, radial location of the source, and the magenta circle is a 95% confidence contour of an unidentified Fermi source uh, present in the third uh, Fermi catalog. Uh, the cyan circles are 68 and 95% uh, confidence contours uh, from our study, and with high confidence we identify this gamma ray source with the uh, radio source PAC 1718. <coughs> and the image on the left hand side uh, comes from the work by Makani et al. 2016. This is an HST uh, image of the host galaxy, and the black contours uh, represent molecular hydrogen. The uh, gray uh, square here is an 8 by 8 arc second field of view of Symphony VLT, and that the redshift of the source, 8 arc second, corresponds to about 2.5 kiloparsec. So I refer you to this paper and references that are contained in this paper. So if you are interested in the kinematics of the gas in the innermost uh, regions of the galaxy. Uh, early optical studies indicated that the host of the galaxy is of a liner type and um, a weak non-stellar power law contribution, presumably from a weak accretion disk, uh, has been detected. This is our Chandra image of the source. So in terms of the X-ray properties, uh, the source luminosity in 2 to 10 keV band is quite Low on the order of 10 to the 41 x per second, the photon index is typical, 1.75, and the intrinsic absorption is quite low at the level of 10 to the 21 per centimeter square. <coughs> Let me now introduce a theoretical framework that we used to model uh, broadband data of this source. So the model was first um, uh, proposed by Begelman and Chaffee in 1989 and it was proposed to explain classical double-double radio sources expanding in an ambient medium. And then later on, it was proposed by Stavash et al. and Ostorero et al. that this model may be also applicable to the compact symmetric objects. So in the framework of this model, the jet momentum flux is balanced by the run pressure of the ambient medium. Sideways expansion velocity equals the velocity of the shock driven by the overpressured cocoon. And uh, uh, the jet kinetic power is transformed at the hotspots into the energy of the cocoon. <coughs> so the hotspots are marked here with those orange patches. And the ultra-relativistic electrons are injected from the hotspots into the expanding radio lobes. The model follows the evolution of the electrons and includes all the relevant adiabatic and radiative losses. And high energy emission is due to the inverse Compton scattering of the uh, soft photon fields of uh, the energetic electrons. So the relevant soft photon fields at the scales of compact symmetric objects are the UV photons from presumably from an accretion disk and infrared uh, photons, <coughs> for example, from a dusty torus. There are many model parameters and they fall into four broad categories such as geometry, so for example the linear size of the source and the uh, jet head advanced velocity, luminosities and characteristic frequencies, so luminosities of the soft photon fields and the uh, radio turnover frequency, and the parameters that describe the injected electron population and the environment. So fortunately in case of this source, many of the parameters that fall into those two first categories can be set because of the low energy observations in radio uh, radio to optical, and our high energy data allowed us to constrain most of the parameters uh, from those two other categories. <coughs> and here I show uh, an example of our modeling. On the left, uh, I show the uh, spectral model and uh, broadband data, and uh, on the right, there are zooms into the radio, infrared, X-ray, and gamma ray bands. So black dots here represent data that we uh, took from the NET database, and uh, blue shapes uh, correspond to the radio, infrared, X-ray, and gamma ray observational constraints. Uh, we model the soft photon fields with uh, black body components, and the thin black line represents here a synchrotron spectrum in the radio, while the thick black line is the sum of the inverse Compton high-energy components. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
So I would like to stress that the high energy data, X-ray and gamma ray data, are crucial in constraining uh, parameters of the injected um, uh, electron energy distribution. And the data required that this distribution is described by a broken power law with uh, um, indices and uh, Lorentz factor corresponding to the break given here in the table. The table contains also the jet power that is required by the model and it is on the order of 10 to the 42 arc per second. And the model was computed for a relatively high density of the ISM of 10 uh, particles per centimeter cube. So uh, this is a preliminary result and a complete exploration of the model parameter space is still a work in progress. However, this is a very encouraging result because it tells us that a model that was originally developed to explain large-scale radio galaxies uh, may be scaled down with linear size and may give us important clues about the physics of the youngest extragalactic jets. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, I would like to stress that even though until now we have only one uh, compact symmetric object that has gamma ray emission, we are paying close attention to the progress that is happening in the radio band because radio surveys are crucial to identify new compact symmetric object candidates. And those candidates should be followed in X-rays with Chandra and XMM Newton. And uh, we will also look, um, search the Fermilat archives for any possible associations in the gamma ray band. And uh, just to uh, remind you and summarize the first part of my talk, I would like to bring back the plot that shows uh, size of the radio source, luminosity, radio luminosity, and the distribution of the intrinsic uh, <coughs> hydrogen column densities in the X-rays. And uh, something that I didn't mention before, I think, is that the region where the um, radio source size lies between, say, 5 and 50 parsecs is of particular interest to us because it appears that all the unabsorbed sources are seen when the radio size is larger than a few tens of parsecs. So this brings up an important question about the location of the uh, dense material in the vicinity of, of the CSOs and also about the origin of the X-ray emission. So it can be, for example, that um, the dense clouds, they are located at this range of distances from the black hole and the X-ray emission comes from the radio lobes, but once the radio lobes expand beyond this range, they are not obscured anymore. Or it could be also that the expanding radio lobes jets are able to destroy those clouds, and so the sources that are larger appear unobscured. So at the moment, we know about uh, 10 new CSOs, compact symmetric objects with sizes uh, in this range, and they have no X-ray information. So it is imperative to follow those sources in X-rays. Thank you for your attention. This is an this is a no. So we tried several densities, uh, starting with one per centimeter cube. This is like a typical density of ISM, and we are just exploring uh, the parameter space. And one of the constraints is so that the uh, expansion along the direction of the jet is um, uh, so that the uh, sideways expansion is not faster than the expansion along the uh, Chat. Because. But this is a, an exploration of the parameter space. And then the parameters of the energy distribution, actually, of the electrons, they don't differ much uh, while we change the uh, density. So, so. That density you know, violates your 10 to the 20 number for NH? That's about yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this needs to be checked uh, in detail. So we are at the stage of uh, developing the parameter space and checking all those models. We have uh, many model runs and 
But so uh, they are seen in the radio data. My understanding is that the radio... Not in the picture you showed us, but uh, oh, okay. there are better data. So some data show radio lobes, some uh, radio data of the sources show edge brightening, so this is representative of the spots. In some of the sources also you can detect the core, and then you actually have a, uh, also a better constraint about the symmetricity of the source. Mm -hmm. Quick, just quickly, if the, fundamentally if there's a difference imposed by the density, mm -hmm. shouldn't you be seeing a different velocity profile or deceleration if you're confined, mm -hmm. and is that seen? So I'm looking at this data now, and uh, I try to, uh, you know, color code this plot, not only uh, with the intrinsic density, but combination with the expansion velocity and so on. So in general, well, I don't have a result yet, but in general, those velocities, expansion velocities, are on the order between uh, 10 and 50 percent of the speed of light. So. Yep. You go back to your SED. Is that point way up there at the top? Is that real? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think so. So those points are from the um, uh, from the net database, and uh, I normalized the uh, black body that corresponds here f uh, to start to the accretion disk by uh, using the data from the paper by Filipenko, who detected uh, a power law um, component into the uh, host starlight. So this represents. Uh, a black body needed to explain this power law contribution. What are the black points that, that are above your dash curve? Yeah, those. Where, are those from Philip Penko? No, those, uh, the black circles yeah. are all from the net database. So those are different measurements in the optical band at different frequencies. This is just for illustration how the archival uh, <coughs> data look like. But the black body here is normalized to the amount of the power law detected in the starlight of the host. Thank you. all going to be in Latin. Yeah. I, was I was trying to organize a simultaneous translation, but uh, it didn't work. If you give a speech in Latin, you have to have a clap, because those are supposed to clap your shoes. <laughs> Actually, it took me probably a half a day to figure out how to translate uh, remnant. Hello, can you hear me? So this is a page from uh, the book that Kepler wrote uh, <clears throat> in 1606 uh, describing one object. And it was this uh, um, object um, that he found, oh, here it is, noted N, new nova, in October 1604 uh, in the constellation Ophiuchus, the serpent handler, obviously shown here, uh, and that's the foot, that's the head of the uh, serpent uh, handler. Um, so um, I show this figure because uh, it's rare that we have the ability to uh, go back to a uh, um, notary, notable 
uh, astronomer in the past for a, a, a useful measurement. Um, and so this measurement of the date of the explosion turns out to be very important for this particular subject. Uh, and so it's, uh, Kepler, of course, is one of the historical remnants, and we know only a few such remnants with uh, the age of explosion. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about, uh, and I've sort of uh, added remnant here to uh, um, Kepler's title, uh, and, uh, uh, and I've added a uh, sort of a weirdo picture of Kepler in the background there. He, he really was kind of a, a strange as well, but let's not get into that uh, today. Um, <laughs> Uh, today I'm going to talk about a paper that came out this summer uh, that was uh, that my Japanese grad student uh, Toshiki Sato uh, uh, really worked 95% uh, on. I just gave him some ideas, uh, and so uh, it's uh, about a set of knots that we found in the remnant based on X-ray data. So I need to go through a little bit of detail on the history of the remnant. So. Um, it was uh, observed, uh, discovered on October 9th, although Kepler only started seeing it on the 17th of October in 1604. Uh, he observed and recorded the brightness for over a year. Uh, it was bright enough that he could see in the daytime. Uh, and he quoted the position that was within four arc minutes of the remnant centroid. So we're pretty confident that the remnant we see now is, in fact, the, uh, the supernova that Kepler observed. Uh, Botta discovered the optical remnant uh, a long time ago, uh, and uh, even a long time ago as well, the radio emission was discovered. Uh, and then it was an X-ray uh, discovery uh, by some of the early uh, satellites, uh, by uh, the high energy satellites. Uh, so this is a modern view of uh, how Kepler looks in uh, three different wave bands. Uh, Chandra is shown in blue. And this actually, uh, we're only showing here uh, one of the bands of Chandra. It's the band that shows the very high energy photons. And this indicates the. Uh, uh, the locations where particles are being acceler accelerated at the forward shock uh, through uh, a process likely to be diffusive shock acceleration. And we're seeing relativist electrons here uh, all around the rim, the forward shock of the remnant. Uh, the thermal emission, uh, which is the lower energy emission from, uh, that, that can be seen by Chandra, is dominated by uh, metal lines from silicon and sulfur and iron and other elements. Uh, the optical emission is shown here uh, from Hubble. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this, uh, and people uh, uh, like John Raymond and uh, Ravi Shankar, who is here, uh, worked a lot, have worked a lot on this, uh, measuring proper motions of fe features in this optical band. Uh, and then this is the Spitzer data. So one of the characteristics of Tycho which, of Kepler, I'm sorry, which you should recognize, is the fact that there's a very strong gradient in the brightness, which uh, uh, points to a gradient in the density of the ambient medium. The other point I want to make uh, is that um, the uh, direction this way is direction toward the galactic plane. That will be useful later. So uh, we have an, a distance, not very well uh, observed, uh, known distance to the remnant. People typically claim 5 kiloparsecs. And in that case, the remnant is about 3.8 parsecs in diameter. It has an expansion velocity of about 5,000 kilometers per second. And its distance above the plane is quite high. It's 600 parsecs. So you should begin to think about why there would be a, a dense gradient in the ambient medium uh, at 600 parsecs above the plane. Adding more confu confusion is the fact that that dense medium uh, shows uh, a nitrogen-rich abundance uh, and has a rather large density in uh, some of the knots. And extinction, high and variable. And I already mentioned the strongly ambient, uh, asymmetric ambient medium. So the, I talked about the X-ray emission. This is sort of a, a representative spectra from XMM of uh, the X-ray emission from Kepler uh, showing iron lines and silicon and sulfur lines, a very strong iron K line here. Uh, the uh, evidence for, strong, uh, for emission from ejecta is, in fact, the presence of the strong iron. It really wants me to join the uh, join. Uh, yes, I'm going to do that. Sorry. All right, so um, 
uh, evidence for ejecta, strong iron and silicon, uh, and the fact that it's stratified. The iron is interior to the silicon, uh, and the absence of oxy oxygen ejecta. These are all important, uh, and they sort of lead to the conclusion that uh, Kepler was of a 1A origin, uh, and that the um, in information here about the ambient medium says that it's one of those that have a CSM interaction. Uh, so let's try to think of a model that we could generate for uh, this unusual situation, the characteristics of Kepler and its uh, high distance above the plane. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, Reno Bandiera came up with this first scenario, which I, I when I I'd worked on Kepler for my thesis, and pan, uh, Reno's paper came out shortly thereafter, and I was just I just thought it was so elegant and wonderful. Uh, and so, what he proposed was that there was a high speed star moving about 300 kilometers per second uh, that was losing mass off towards the northwest, moving away from the plane. Uh, and uh, that the wind material was being compressed in the direction of motion uh, and built up a bow shock. The remnant then exploded into that, and we now see illuminated that, amb that asymmetric ambient medium. This was back when we really didn't know so much about the type 1As uh, being uh, from uh, single degenerate, non -de uh, double degenerate models. Uh, and, and it wasn't clear what the uh, type of the supernova was, so it was, uh, he modeled this as the progenitor star. Uh, that would have, loosed, uh, would have been uh, on its way to exploding uh, as like a core collapse supernova. But we believe now it's a 1A. And so more recent hydro models, uh, and I think uh, Dan, uh, Dan Padna has done some of those modeling as well, uh, use a single degenerate uh, type 1 model, uh, and the wind is coming from the donor that's losing mass and growing the white dwarf up to its Chandrasekhar limit. However, there is a problem with that because there's no evidence for a surviving red giant. Uh, asymptotic giant branch star or a post-AGB star in the central region of Kepler. So there's still quite a bit uh, that needs to uh, uh, mysteries about um, Kepler. So um, we are not dealing with all of those issues now. We're taking a sort of as given that Kepler was a 1A, and I will focus the, argument, uh, the arguments that I make later on in the context of Kepler being a 1A. And so what we did uh, was to look at the kinematics of the remnant. And so, uh, in fact, what we did was to identify a handful of compact knots in, the in, in, in either intensity or redshift. Uh, and so this at the top shows the intensity map. And so I hope you can see that there's, uh, the boxes fill, uh, cover some of the features that we decided to study. Uh, and down here is radial velocity. And this is something new that we've been trying to do with Chandra data, pushing it to its uh, extreme limit and maybe beyond. Right, Paul? Um, and that is to actually take the silicon line uh, and that these remnants, uh, Kepler and Tycho, have very strong silicon lines. And so we can actually split them up and consider the red side as a red shifted, blue side as blue shifted, and then sort of low velocity in the middle. And we make a three color map. Uh, and this actually came out quite, quite good here for the, the red gun seems to be very strong here at, uh, at Harvard. Um, and these are actually, uh, if you believe uh, the measurement that this indicates redshift, we're actually seeing highly red shifted knots. The thing that, was, uh, that really uh, focused us very clearly on this is when we looked at the proper motion. And this is just taking the difference in two epochs over a, separated by 14 years. You actually see that these features, many of them associated with these knots here, appear to have significant proper motions. Okay? And so uh, we, we, we started to uh, look at this and analyze it. And we used all four data sets from Chandra over uh, 14 years. Uh, and so here is, uh, here is a figure uh, that Toshki generated that encapsulates essentially all of our proper motion measurements. So um, uh, what we did was, was to take, um, let's choose a knot up here. So we choose that knot, okay? And in the very deep observation, the LP, Chandra LP, we use that as the reference. And we define uh, that shape of that knot as the model. And then we just shift it to match that shape of that, that, that uh, knot in the other epochs. And so we then plot here um, the uh, chi-squared contours in different colors. So this is, uh, uh, this is the first epoch, second epoch, and the, and the fourth epoch. And so you can actually see here that the color gradient indicates the direction of motion uh, consistent across uh, all three different proper motions that we can measure for the four different observations we have. And so the visual impression you should get of this image is an, a general outward expansion of most of these individual knots, although some of them, labeled very cleverly 
circumstellar medium, show very little motion. Okay, so here's a couple of CSM knots that aren't moving much. Here's another one. Uh, and then here's the southwest two, two knots uh, moving uh, outward again. Okay, um, so um, we, uh, the main source of uncertainty in the measurements of the proper motion is the relative alignment of the four different frames from Chandra. But we were fortunate in having enough serendipitous stars around the outside that were able to align each of the images to something like 0.2 arc seconds. Okay? So you take 0.2 arc seconds and divide by 14 years, which is, uh, well, uh, our biggest baseline with respect to the LP is something like six or seven years. That drives that error down quite a bit. Okay? So we get highly significant motions. Okay? What else do we do? All right, so now that we have these proper motions, the very first thing you can think about doing is extrapolating back to the center. And we had to dig deep in order to get that useful value of data from that Latin tome, which is the age of the remnant, 1604. And when we did that, we were able to say these are where these knots would have been at 1604 if they were moving at constant speed, just ballistically, okay? So um, it looks like a jumble. But if you look near the center of the remnant, and these three different color points indicate where previous measurements of the center of the remnant were, uh, we actually find that there are these five individual knots seem to be statistically consistent with a single central position. Okay? Again, assuming that each of these knots is moved with undecelerated motion, just ballistically. And so if we then uh, average those positions and say, well, that's where the explosion occurred, we can now actually iterate. We can say, well, maybe those knots were not moving completely undecelerated. Let's assume they decelerated a little bit and see where, uh, and, and iterate. So we uh, use this center to calculate the new, the deceleration rates of these guys, then use that deceleration rate to calculate back where the center is, average them, and do this process. So it's an iterative process. We went through about 30 steps until it converged, and we got a new center. Okay? So this represents the center only of those five knots uh, in which uh, the center is uh, consistent between all of these, but each of these knots has a slightly different uh, deceleration amount. All of them are actually quite high. In other words, they've, uh, they're moving at uh, Radius goes as time to some index, and the index is something like 0.75, three quarters, or close to unity. Uh, one of these is very close to unity. Um, so we now have a measurement of the kinematic center of Kepler's supernova remnant that's accurate to four arc seconds. Okay, that's, that's uh, bigger than that, that uh, cross. Uh, okay, so one of the first things you can do is, again, uh, go back to this question of, is there a surviving donor star? Okay, and so... Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this. Uh, Wolfgang Kurzendorf has done a lot of the work here, and we're, we're referring to his uh, work here. He identified uh, a number of bright stars, all shown out in cyan, cyan color here. Uh, and so this is our position, and this is the, um, uh, uh, this is the error bar on uh, position. And then if we assume that there's a possibility that the progenitor may have moved, the donor star may have moved a little bit, uh, by a few hundred kilometers per second, uh, we get this outer circle. So this now, in our opinion, represents the best place to be searching for the leftover donor star uh, for, uh, a, uh, for a uh, single degenerate type scenario. Now, a traditional SD scenario doesn't work, so it would have to be a non-traditional one. So, uh, and those stars tend to be a lot fainter, so this gives, you a, this gives a, a, a tighter search region for, uh, for looking for that um, possible leftover companion star. But there's more. So what we've done uh, is to use, is to now get to the radial velocity. Remember I showed you that last panel earlier where it looked like there were red and blue shifted knots? Well, we went off and we used uh, the spectral data here for a selection of knots to actually try to measure the uh, redshift of each of those individual knots. At the same time, we also get measurements of the composition from our fits. And we, you know, we, we had to carry out uh, you know, expect fits with certain models and certain assumptions, all of which I believe are plausible. We get good fits. And so the first thing I show here is the velocities we're getting from different knots. So uh, some of these ejecta knots are quite high in velocity, uh, plus and minus, while circumstellar knots, uh, and this ejecta knot I'll talk about a little bit more, are sort of closer to zero. Uh, so uh, the other thing we found was that uh, some of the knots, the circumstellar knots, as shown here, uh, appear in Chandra, obviously, 
but they also appear in H alpha in the Hubble imaging. Um, this is another set, CSM two and three, uh, and they seem to have counterparts in the uh, optical. But the ejecta knots we found are not visible in H alpha. None of those high speed ejecta knots appear in the visible in the optical in H alpha in O three, uh, and I think there's also uh, sulfur two. So we don't see them. Uh, we see no evidence for the optical emission from those knots. So the composition is quite interesting too. So um, the ejecta knots, which are basically these three panels here, they come in basically two general types. Those where the silicon and sulfur is quite high with respect to iron, and those where uh, the silicon and sulfur are similar to iron. Uh, both of these pair uh, sets have low oxygen. So we have low oxygen, silicon and sulfur, and some iron. It turns out that actually tells us exactly where in the exploded 1A that emission had to have come. Uh, these knots had to have come. So this shows a uh, plot of the mass fraction of different elemental species as a function of enclosed mass. And uh, silicon and sulfur are here, and iron, uh, nickel 56, or iron is here. That drops off at this regime. This is where the burning turns from being uh, more toward partial silicon burning. And so we believe these knots have to have come from some region in here based on uh, the similarity of the iron to silicon and sulfur abundances, or the more enhanced silicon and sulfur with respect to iron. Excuse me, Jack. Yep. If you change it to an energetic 1A, like in Katsuda's paper and in our paper, that would push where those knots came from. Exactly. I just chose W7 as an example. But it's, I believe it's a characteristic of all of them that there is this unburned zone outside. Where exactly in mass coordinate it is depends on the model you assume. Uh, so, and I'll just point out that the circumstellar knots uh, are generally around solar, while these ejecta knots, which we actually took from the optical, uh, Ravi's work on uh, some of the expansion of the optical correspond to these knots here, and they look like they're ejecta dominated, but maybe have some interstellar or uh, circumstellar contribution. Okay, so um, this is sort of the, the, the plot that summarizes all of our velocities. So we include the radial velocities with the proper motions, assume a distance of 5 kiloparsecs, and we get 3D space velocities along here. Uh, and from, uh, just from the age of the remnant and the proper motion measurements, doesn't depend on the radial velocity measurements from the spectrum, we get the expansion index. Okay? These are undecelerated knots. So some of our knots at the highest 3D speed are moving close to undecelerated motion. So we count uh, anything above 0.75 as uh, these these one, two, three, four, five, those are the ones we use for the kinematic center. So those are the least decelerated knots, also among the highest moving knots. Circumstellar knots are down here. They're not moving a lot. They're also not uh, expanding out rapidly. Uh, and then these are the two knots that correspond to, uh, to features exactly in the, uh, in the H alpha uh, study, uh, in the optical study. And, and I'm, I show a little bit here. So for the X-ray analysis, we combined these two regions uh, and these two regions. So we only have two knots. So that's ejecta 1, 2, uh, and ejecta 3, 4. So this is ejecta 1, 2, ejecta 3, 4. We get good agreement with the optical measurements here. The optical measurements are moving, actually measuring these beautiful shocks that are really moving out, these H alpha shocks. So uh, for ejecta 3, 4, we get a consistent measurement for the X ray knot that's driving that motion. So that really puts the two together in a nice, uh, consistent manner. For the ejecta 1 and 2, the optical data clearly sees the shock moving out, but the X-ray data is blobby, is less well resolved. Uh, certainly, Chandra doesn't have Hubble resolution, and we get some of this low-velocity material mixed in. So we don't get good agreement with our proper motion of ejecta one and two because we're including uh, lower-velocity material there. But by and large, uh, we believe these results are pretty consistent uh, with um, uh, with what uh, other people have seen. Uh, certainly, for the knots in common, which are only uh, the ones down here. Uh, okay, so um, these new ejecta knots fall up here. They're all in the high um, speed, high expansion index uh, region. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, what we seem to be uh, claiming, what we're claiming, what we see, is that the ejecta knots reach up to speeds of about 10,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so uh, how do these knots survive? That's, that was a question that we worried about. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, we, we don't have a definitive answer yet. We only sort of have some qualitative arguments that come from some studies that uh, Roger Chevalier was involved in uh, a number of years ago. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to understand why knots of ejecta in, in Tycho supernova remnant appeared far out near the, the forward shock. Okay? 
And so what they, and, and Tycho has a similar evolutionary state to that of Kepler. So we think we, it's valid to use, the, uh, use those region, uh, these models. So what happens is, in the model, they have a, a knot entering this Rorschach heated zone. And as the knot passes through that zone, uh, it begins to get shredded uh, and uh, destroyed on a time scale that's fairly short. So, um, however, uh, it's clear that even in this evolutionary phase or this evolutionary phase, you have a distinct knot that exists out to, uh, uh, out to uh, quite large radii. So, um, there's basically two ways, according to Wang and Chevalier, for knots to survive. First, knots need to be formed either with a, formed with a very high density contrast. So they're really dense bullets, and they can survive a lot of uh, interaction in this high pressure zone. Okay, so that's one opportunity, one uh, one option. Another option is, uh, as shown here, where the the interaction zone, this hot pressure, high pressure zone, is rather uh, thin and small. And that happens early on when, uh, young, when the young evolutionary phases, where the Vershock hasn't had time to build up a large uh, size. Uh, and, and for uh, the age and explosion energy and other evolutionary parameters of Kepler, uh, that corresponds to low densities. In fact, it corresponds to much, much lower densities than we, we, we estimate for most of the dense shell of the region that would have formed from the bow shock. So that, that is a, so we have these two ways of explaining why we can see these knots still moving close to undecelerated motion. All right, so um, the summary. We found knots in Kepler that are moving at undecelerated motion. Their composition uh, points to uh, a specific place in the star that blew up as a 1A uh, where partial silicon burning occurred. Okay. And the actual mass coordinate, as, as Dan pointed out to me, uh, depends on the type of model, the 1A model that you use, but there's a consistent pattern that partial silicon burning occurs uh, in, in all of the models that we use to describe 1As. We have an accurate kinematic center defined by five ejecta knots that we can use to limit the search for uh, a non-traditional single degenerate scenario, a uh, leftover companion. Radial velocities vary over this range from minus 8,000 to about 10,000 kilometers per second from Chandra spectral analysis. When we put together that together with the proper motion, we get a 3D space velocities that are consistent with the velocity of silicon-rich ejecta seen in the 1As during their explosion time. So we have the, the connection now, a pretty good connection, between the velocity we're measuring these knots and the velocities at which they might have been uh, seen in the, uh, as, uh, when they were supernovae. Uh, and so the, the survival of high-speed knots require that they're either high-density contrast, which I really don't favor because uh, I think it's a challenge to try to get dense uh, clumps out of a 1A explosion where most of the models are relatively uh, smooth. Uh, and I would prefer if there were, and I think the other option is more likely, which is that uh, the wind uh, or the circumstellar medium around Kepler uh, actually is uh, structured, highly structured. It has dense parts, but it also has gaps or windows through which some of these ejecta knots can propagate and survive uh, to uh, 400 years now after uh, you know, Kepler, uh, uh, Kepler made the original discoveries. So that's it. Thank you. No. Um, no. Uh, well, uh, maybe. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, this question was asked to me by Jim Stone, which is, so you have these, uh, you have the velocity, the radial velocity, and the proper motion. So that defines an angle. Okay. So you can then figure out where their knot is in three dimensions with respect to the remnant. Okay. Uh, and so. Uh, I worried a little bit about that, so let me go back to the image. So here's the image. So, uh, uh, so uh, this is sort of the maximum extent we see ejecta in Kepler. So you wouldn't want this to be much further away from the center than these things. You would not expect that to be way out here. I actually did look way out there to see if there were any knots of ejecta way out. There aren't. So uh, 
But uh, so five kiloparsecs actually does put this knot a little bit out beyond here. So if the distance were six or seven, I think it'd be more consistent with being sort of uh, at knot to an extreme, a distance from the center of the remnant. But that's an important point. You're absolutely right. And uh, so because of that, we can actually use these measurements to, uh, we can actually use the measurements to figure out the distance. I don't believe, we'd have to make some symmetry assumption about the distribution of these in order to use the proper motions and the radial velocities to get a distance. And I think with these five, it's just too few. So the length of the, of the random donor star suggests to me that it might be actually a stellar measurement. Uh, That's fine. I, you know, I don't, have, I don't have a fight in that game, but I, you need to get that wind out there. You need to get that ambient medium. I think, no, I think, uh, I think the main reason uh, we search for single degenerates is because we can, right? We can constrain the presence of a single degenerate companion there. So that's certainly a pretty strong argument that there's the traditional scenario doesn't work. Um, so you have to tell me how a double degenerate model could lead to a ambient medium that has this bow shock in it. So um, I don't know if anyone's come up with a real convincing argument. Should I put you on the spot? Do you know something? We actually noted that when we move the center of the uh, expansion down here through this iterative process, it lines up with the symmetry axis of these ears. So we specifically recognized that and quoted no. Yes. Okay. So then, for those knots, I, I assume they're soft X-ray knots with an optical counterpart. Is your X-ray velocity, if you will, consistent with, for example, uh, um, the optical line velocity from those optically bright knots? Um, I don't know, but I would the the um, the precision at which one can do the optical velocities is far higher than what we can do. Um, we did this study for. We did a study for Tycho uh, a year ago where we, um, where we actually compared the velocities we got from the ACES I detector and the ACES S detector. They're totally different detectors in how they work uh, and software and the uh, calibration and how their gain is calculated. And uh, we uh, estimated the error on the radial velocity, and it's very large. It's 500 to 1,000 kilometers. So. Um, if we were measuring speeds of 1,000 kilometers per second, I would not be up here talking. But 8 to 10,000 is very hard to, just, to explain away as an instrumental effect. So uh, if, you know, so I think the 500 or so kilometers per second that we get for um, the low speed knots here, right? So we're getting um, speeds of, you know, 1,000 kilometers or less. I think that's within our error bar for our measurement of velocity here. So, so you're worrying, what is the density of the knot itself? Not itself and the medium. It's hard to tell the medium because it's all surround. These are projected right on top of the remnant. So it's hard to see what the, um, it doesn't look as if there is a, um, um, a, um, a lower density medium there, but we would not be sensitive to seeing that in the well, ambient medium. It's already been overrun. I don't, I don't know. We would love to have a, we would love to be able to say whether this is the complete census of knots that we're seeing um, or whether they're only the knots we're seeing because they're passing through windows in the ambient medium. We, we can't answer that. But we can actually see there, there are, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, hard to see here, but there are, uh, there actually are sort of blue, blue, red, blue shifted knots in like a line across here, and then there's red shifted knots in a line across here. So uh, there are complex patterns between the velocities that we see based on the radial velocity measurements. Um, at the beginning, uh, when you mentioned 500 kilometers per second uh, for the progenitor, right? 300, yeah, 300, yeah. 
It's all completely, uh, it's all completely hand wringing. It's very hard. It would have to be a very, even uh, Reno noted that, that it was a very high velocity for, uh, yes, yes. No, no, no. I don't think there's a re there's no red giant here. No, I mean the leftover. Over Whatever's left over, yeah. Uh, you know, um, Wolfgang did uh, spectroscopy to get all uh, of essentially all of these stars in cyan. So the next step would be sort of space-based spectroscopy. I think these are, these stars are way too faint to do from the ground. Maybe uh, VLT. Um, I, I don't know. It's going to be very hard, I think, to go to the next level. Uh, and like M stars and stuff like that, it's going to be very hard. Like he didn't do the silent probe. He didn't know about no, he didn't, actually. You're right. There is a window there. So it turns out that one of these stars is very high proper motion, but, but they know about it. It's uh, low velocity. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a nearby star. Uh, you can pl plop the Gaia stars down on here, and you actually see, just by comparing the Hubble to the Gaia, uh, that uh, there's proper motions associated with essentially all of these little stars. Small, but there's actually a lot. For, I think it's C that has a large proper motion, but it's in the wrong direction. It's that way. So it turns out I doesn't have a radial velocity measurement, so it might be interesting. Uh, it's not quite, uh, it's, a, you know, it's tens of lumin solar luminosities, and G is a relatively high donor probability, according to... Uh, Wolfgang. So uh, there's still some things here, but uh, finding the signature that confirms it from optical spectra is something that I, I haven't seen that there's a, a smoking gun. So it's, it's, that's a really hard problem. Yeah, no, exactly. But how fluffy it is, we still, are, we, we still want to uh, measure the density of these knots. And there's a, a few other things we're doing in a follow-on paper uh, where we try to learn more about these knots. But I think trying to model these uh, in the context of what the ambient medium might be, uh, would, be very, uh, would be very important, too. Oh, uh, yeah, but it, how would you get such a structure that far above the plane? I guess that's the, the issue, right? If you, have a, um, if you just have a density gradient, you can, then you do the, uh, do the, um, then you explode something into it, you'll get that bow shock shape. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, you basically, the way you integrate along the column um, to get the X-ray emission, it gives you that same shape, even though, because you basically have a spherical thing going into something with like an exponential density gradient. Yeah, but, but you know, there's so much information here. There's the nitrogen-rich nature. There's the high density. There's the I didn't even mention Brian Williams has measurements of dust silicates that look like they're from an AGB star. So this is this is this is a really interesting object, and we're not answering any questions. We're just adding more mystery or more more information to it, and it's just one of those wonderful things. Uh, to study a single object in such gory detail. So, um, the sense of the density uh, gradient that you need is that the density increases with weight of the galactic Correct. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah, that, this all, <laughs> that's a very hard box to fit into. Yeah.